welcome everyone for today's webinar, uh, joint webinar of various sites and techniques. Uh, today, the topic is asymmetric multiprocessing on heterogeneous multiprocessor system with open AMP. Uh, my name is Tal Semo. I'm Energy Director of Sales and Marketing for Varisite. Uh, and together with me is David Kauschke, uh, Software Developer from, for uh, Ignex Digital. So welcome, David, uh, and welcome, everyone. And uh, we'll start with the presentation. Next slide, please. So uh, the webinar agenda for today uh, we'll give a short overview for Varisite. Uh, then we'll follow with, uh, David will take us to some technical discussion on motivation of multiprocessor -process systems. Uh, then we'll discuss a little bit more on the open AMP. Uh, we'll discuss how to implement approaches by Ignex Digital. Uh, and uh, also about evaluation, latency, read time, if read time is possible. And we'll finish by conclusion, and some we'll, we'll uh, leave some time for Q and A. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. So I will take a quick a quick review about Varisite. So uh, Varisite uh, uh, is a system of module manufacturer, design and manufacturer. Uh, this year we are celebrating 20 years in business uh, with a very extensive customer base and pipeline. Uh, we provide a stable supply chain using our state-of-the-art Intel production facilities, uh, which ensure complete control over the manufacturing process from uh, uh, manufacturing, testing, shipping, and everything is in-house. Uh, Varisite also provides direct support from our R&D team uh, with responses in up to 24 hours. Uh, and of course, Varisite provides the highest quality standards meeting strict regulatory requirements, including the uh, 9001 ISO, but also the medical ISO and the environmental ISO as well. And also Varisite provides a quite large ecosystem of partners for complete end-to-end -end solution based on our system on models. Next slide, please. Some of Varisite advantage, so first of all, and we'll, we'll see it in a minute, Varisite provides two pin compatible product families that allows our customers seamless migration for future technologies so you can design uh, your hardware and in the future jump to a different and more powerful song without any hardware changes. Uh, we also provide the ultimate song customization. So because we have our own production lines, we allow our customer to fully customize the song and select exactly the features they need. For example, the RAM size and memory size, if they need Wi-Fi, if they need audio, if they need Ethernet, everything is fully configurable and allow the customer to select his own uh, configuration and optimize the price of the song. Uh, Varisite, we can state we have 100% yield all the time. This is because we are doing 100% functional tests to all the song that ships from our warehouse, okay? So everything that is totally ch checked, fully ch functional test before uh, it leaves our warehouse. Uh, we provide production-ready hardware and software, uh, and our platform are very, very mature and with low risk because they've been tested and used by hundreds of customers. We also provide uh, free support for our customers through our customer portal, our developer center, uh, GitHub, and our uh, and we also provide uh, CAD drawings and EMC testing. So provide very, very close support to our customers, and of course very robust longevity of up to 15 years for hardware and software. Next slide. So uh, just a quick review of what is the system model for people that doesn't, uh, the, the people that don't know this concept yet. So basically what you can see here uh, is in the middle is the SOM module. Uh, the SOM comes with, this is actually the brain of the product. It comes with all the important features of the processor, the memory, the storage, you know, the audio, the internet, the Wi-Fi. Uh, and then you only need to design a carrier board uh, that will this song will be attached into. And of course, sometimes you need some thermal solution with heat sink and so on. Okay, so together uh, with the SOM and your carrier board or main board, this is actually uh, how is the actually SOM is integrated into uh, different products. Next slide. 
So here is a, a brief review of our two pin-to-pin -pin, uh, uh, families of SOMs. On the left side, we have our VAR SOM pin-to-pin -pin family. This is the largest pin-to-pin uh, -pin family. So you can see this is based on uh, SOD edge connector, very common in this industry. And this pin-to-pin -pin family start with the low end, the VAR SOM 6UL, which is a single cortex A7 up to 900 megahertz. Then it goes to the entire IMX6 family, if it's a solo dual or the Varsom MX6 itself, and then the entire IMX8 family, the 8X, the Quad Max, the MX8 Quad Max, the MX8M Nano Mini Plus, uh, and two new releases, the newest MX93 based on NXP IMX93 processor, and a new family member from TI, the Varsom AM62, which is based on the IAM62 uh, processor. All these SOMs in the family, uh, the majority of them are, are for a Cortex A53 quad core uh, with 64 bits. On the right side, you have our Dart pin to pin family. This is a little bit smaller family. Uh, the Dart is unique because it's, it's based, it's actually designed for uh, small size and for application with size constraint. Uh, they are smaller side and they also use board to board connector. So mainly the Dart family is for size constraints products. Next slide. Uh, so a few words on the SOM that we'll, we'll later uh, discuss the implementation of the MP on it. So we are talking about our VAR SOM MX8X system model. This is uh, based on NXP. Uh, IMX8X processor, it's a quad-core Cortex A35 with up to 1.2 gigahertz uh, clock. Uh, it has on board real-time Cortex M4F uh, core processor. It can come with up to 4 gigabytes of LPDDR4 RAM and up to 1.8 gigabytes of EMC. It supports uh, very strong GPUs, the G G GC7000 Lite. Uh, for two to agility uh, uh, graphic processing unit. It supports 4K Ultra HD video decode and HD video encode, uh, dual gigabit Ethernet, uh, USB 3, USB 2, PCIe. It also supports uh, certified Wi Fi, dual band Wi Fi, and Bluetooth 5.2. And of course, a lot of peripherals like UART, SPIES, ISPRCs. Uh, SD card, touch, uh, CAN bus, and even CAN FD. It's, it can go from up to uh, full industrial temperature grade from minus 40 to 85, and it supports both uh, different flavors of Linux and Android. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, so now yeah. I'll give uh, David the controller. Uh, okay, David, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Tor, for your introduction. Uh, some things about the company where I work, it's called Ingenix Digital. And Ingenix Digital is a recognized partner for cutting edge solutions in a very big field of the digitization because we develop, uh, for example, AI applications with big data based on Spring, Java, Mobile, or we also have the classic software development. We develop applications based on web solutions or uh, using Docker or Python or C++ applications. And we also develop uh, um, embedded systems based on microcontroller or FPGAs or uh, yeah, embedded Linux. So we provide uh, services and de development and concept for the complete sensors to the cloud, also known I I IoT, Internet of Things, where we also um, develop and create concepts for embedded security and something like that. Uh, Genix Digital uh, has experience about uh, 35 years now, and currently Ingenix Digital employs over 200 people in crafting near to Munich in Germany. Some information about myself, I uh, work as a software developer at Ingenix Digital. I complete my master degree in computer science with a focus on embedded systems. And I uh, created my master thesis at Ingenix Digital, where I ported the OpenM framework to the heterogeneous MPSOC IMX 8X from NXP, uh, as Tol already introduced this SOM, which I used. And this presentation is based on the master thesis. Um, yeah. 
And currently my uh, uh, focus in the work is the development and the implementation of application systems on heterogeneous multiprocessors uh, with the focus on the Linux side where I develop uh, board support packages for different hardware systems uh, with adjustments in the Linux kernel, U-boot or in the root file system or uh, create concepts for a secure boot or a secure update. Before we dive into the basics, I want to give you a short preface um, that you, um, because the focus um, of the presentation is on the communication between two different processors on a heterogeneous multiprocessor um, systems on chip, also called MPSOC. So, uh, multiply operating systems on a multi core processor um, are not part of this talk. And if I uh, talk about multiprocessor system, I mean the hardware system. And if I talk about symmetric multiprocessing, also known AMP, AMP, I mean the software system. For example, when a Linux OS uh, runs on a Cortex A processor and uh, Free Atos uh, runs on a Cortex M processor, but later more about uh, this architecture. Yeah, some things about the motivation. Why should I use multiprocessor systems? Uh, some things about the current status. And for example, normally you use microcontrollers, MCUs for low level applications. For example, you have read time requirements, safety requirement, requirements um, for a laser cutter. Then you don't use uh, Cortex A35 where Linux runs. You use a uh, be a metal OS or free ethos, which is located on a Cortex M4 because you need hard read time and uh, hard read time you you don't uh, get on a on a microprocessor MPU because a microprocessor is used normally for high level applications, for example, for HMIs, for cloud applications or big data where uh, hard read time is, is not required. Therefore, you can use a Quad Cortex A35, for example, and there you use also a complete fully operating system like a Linux, which can be built with Yocto or something like that. Here you can see a diagram on the left side, a legacy system design, on the right side, a system design based on MP MPSOC. Um, the problem on the legacy system design, as you can see, there are multiple uh, SOCs integrated. SOC 1 with a Linux where HMI a GUI is running. Then you have a SOC 2 where um, addition connectivity interfaces are provided, for example, Bluetooth, NFC, uh, or CAN, where also a Linux um, is running. And these the, these two cores uh, communicate via USB. And then you have a SOC 3 where you have a read time application, and this read time application is located on a Cortex M4. Um, but uh, you need uh, also communication between the SOC 1 and SOC 3, and therefore a UART interface is used. The problem is that for each uh, SOC, you need an operating system. You uh, need a software bill of material. You must uh, check uh, each SOC, each system for security issues. And then you have hardware interfaces for the communication between the SOCs. And that is very extensive and needs a lot of time during the software development. And therefore, the last years, uh, more and more MP SOCs uh, were created for example, from NXP, the IMX8 or um, IMX7. And there you have in one MPSOC multiple uh, process integrated. So you have a Cortex A53 with a Linux with four cores. Then you have a, a, a Cortex R5 for the connectivity and also a second Cortex R5 for, for safety and read time applications. And these three processors um, can communicate, for example, uh, via shared memory and uh, don't need external interfaces like USB or UART. And also this uh, consolidated system design is more energy efficient, this software bill of material is shorter, and it's easier to evaluate the complete system because you only have to evaluate the complete system uh, and not each SOC uh, separately. 
and um, if you create an image, you only have to create an image and deploy the image for the complete MP sock and not for free socks, as you can see on the left side. Here are some, here are some use cases where you can use uh, MP sock. For example, you can use it for mixed critical systems where you have a crime and for the separation of applications by different processors. So you can, as I mentioned, um, run the safety application on the low level core on uh, Cortex M4. And on the high level core, you can uh, run a cloud application with HMI. Or you can use uh, MPSOC for predictive maintenance, where you, where you monitor the meshing park on the Linux side, which is not uh, uh, read time required. Or you can use MPSOC for hardware in the loop systems, where you have the control on the A processor on the Linux side and the hardware in the loop em emulator, where you need uh, hard read time uh, is placed on the M processor. Of course, there are a lot of other use cases and other industry sectors where, where you can uh, integrate and use uh, MPSOC. Now I want to show you some uh, basics about uh, heterogeneous uh, multiprocessor systems. Um, first, um, in a multiprocessor system co consists of, uh, of a system on chip, also known as SOC, as I mentioned. And if you have multiple processors on a uh, SOC, then the system is called multiprocessor system. And there are uh, two um, additional use cases on the multiprocessor uh, system. It can be homogeneous or heterogeneous. It is heterogeneous if you have only processors with the same instruction set. And if you have multiple processors with uh, different instruction sets, for example, as you can see here, a Cortex A35 um, and a Cortex M4, then you have two processors with different instruction set, and then you have a heterogeneous MPSOC. And these uh, processors, also called application processing unit or read-time uh, processing unit, are integrated um, on a system bus, as you can see on the right. And for example, via the system bus, the APU can reach the memory controller or can reach via the bridge and the peripheral bus, a GPIO or a USB device. Normally, a SOC bus, which is used is, uh, if you have an ARM core uh, AMBA bus or the core connect by IBM. As uh, the next uh, step is we have operating systems on the MPSOC, MPSOC on the hardware. And there are two variants. You have this metric multiprocessing SMP, where you uh, use one operating system on one processor, uh, which runs on all cores. As you can see on the left uh, diagram, you have um, a, cor a Cortex processor. And the Linux is uh, running on all pros on all cores, and on the Linux and user space uh, can multiple applica applications run. On the other side, you can have the variant uh, the asymmetric, asymmetric multiprocessing (AMP), where you have multiple operating systems on one or more processors. For example. Uh, um, here you can see the Linux uh, is running on the Cortex A53, and the Airtos, for example, free Airtos or bare metal, is running on the APU on the Cortex M4. So, if you have a asymmetric multiprocessing setup, you have a lot of challenges that uh, must be solved. Um, here are some of them. For example, you have to solve the memory management because each processor has an operating system and each operating system needs a memory region. Therefore, you have to think about the division of the memory region and which uh, operating system can access which memory region. If you don't um, set up a correct memory management, you have the undefined behavior during runtime, and it can be, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it could be that the Linux can't uh, boot. The second challenge is the resource management, you, um, which is responsible for accessing the I.O. device, because if, the, if two different operating systems uh, access the same I.O., for example, a cheaper I.O., then, it's, uh, then uh, undefined behavior uh, can occur. 
then you have to think about the system boot management because uh, MPSOC have a lot of different subsystems. The boot order must be defined and uh, because of different subsystems with different firmwares, uh, you have uh, extensive boot image, image uh, also known boot container where a lot of firmwares are part of. Then you uh, then a sec and, uh, the, the fourth challenge is the lifecycle management. If you want to uh, load a firmware during runtime, for example, uh, from the Linux to the Cortex M4, then uh, you you must think about the lifecycle management. You want to start the firmware, you want to load the firmware, you want to restart the processor with a new firmware. And the next challenge uh, is the interprocessor communication. Uh, for exchanging data between the processors. And of course, a very important topic, the system security, with, uh, where you uh, need secure boot, secure, secure update and uh, stuff like that. Unfortunately, um, each MPSOC uh, um, has uh, other uh, implementation for the, these uh, heterogeneous. They are not a standard way to solve all these uh, challenges with the same implementation, but there's a framework called OpenAMP, which uh, solves two challenges, challenges um, the lifecycle management and the interprocessor communication, which I want to introduce now. Yeah, um, what is OpenAMP? OpenAMP is a framework for uh, AMP systems with the benefit of a standardization for the interprocessor communication called IPC and for the lifecycle man life cycle management, uh, SEM between the Linux and the Airtros or bare metal. Advantage of the OpenAMP is that it uh, uses open source components for, for example, the virtual I.O., the IP message and the remote proc uh, components, components which are already part of the Linux kernel. And the framework provides a cr cross-platform implementation for uh, Linux, for Airtos, for bare metal, and um, um, also for CIFR as far as I know. Um, and it's also an open source project on GitHub and the MCA OpenAMP working group maintain the open source project OpenAMP where big players are part of, of it. For example, ST, TI, Mentor, Qualcomm, Wind River, and also NXP. Uh, here are also um, some features of OpenAMP. As I already mentioned, uh, it's, uh, one feature is the exchange of the messages between the processors, IPC, as I mentioned. Then the lifecycle management for the control of the remote processor. So with OpenAMP, with the lifecycle management, you can start a remote processor with different firmwares. And also OpenAMP uh, supports the proxy infrastructure which can be used for remote file access or remote console. So you can give your Cortex-M4 with a bare metal uh, a configuration file from Linux, for example. And OpenAMP also provides a low-level abstraction of the shared memory and interrupts. And the configuration of the shared memory and the interrupts can be uh, configured in the device screen. Here uh, you can see a system overview on the Airtros bare metal and the Linux where OpenAMP is, is used. On the left side, you can see the, the Airtros or bare metal where the middleware OpenAMP is used and OpenAMP, uh, as I mentioned, provides the necessary uh, components, uh, the remote proc component, the RP message, the VHO component, and also the hardware dependent porting layer for the uh, specific platform. On the other side, you can see a uh, operating system with a Linux kernel. And as you can see, inside the Linux kernel, there's uh, already a remote proc driver, the RP message driver, and the virtual IO driver. And these components on uh, each side uh, can interact with each other via shared memory and IPIs, but uh, later more about this uh, topic. Of of course, um, there are other uh, ways, approaches to OpenAMP. You don't have to use OpenAMP, but um, yeah, the other other approach could be the uh, Mighty Core framework, Search for Mentor. But this is not an open source framework, therefore I didn't use it. 
yet, then uh, you can also use from NXP the RP message uh, light uh, middleware. But uh, there you, the advantage is that it's a very small uh, middleware. It doesn't need a lot of kilobytes. So if you have uh, Cortex-M4 with um, not a lot of uh, memory, then RP message would be a great way. But with RP message light, you only have the inter-processor communication and not the lifecycle man management or the proxy infrastructure. And the third way approach would be, of course, a proprietary solution, but uh, that would be difficult if you port your proprietary solution to other system because it uh, would uh, generate a lot of uh, effort. Now I want to show you um, implement approach open amp on the MP stock IMX 8X. Um, some constraints and defined goals um, for this implementation. The, the constraints were that I uh, um, that I use the dev kit from Verisite. There were some MX8X, as uh, Troy mentioned. And I used the Yocto for the embedded Linux and the free Atos for the Cortex-M4. And I used the Linux kernel uh, with the version 4.14. And the goals of the Open AMP on the NXP IMX 8X were uh, that the Linux provides the lifecycle management for controlling the Cortex M4. The second goal um, was to create a communication via IP message between the user space, user space on Linux and the free ethos. And the third goal was the measurement of the read time between the user space and the free ethos and check if free time is possible or not. Yeah, what was necessary to achieve the goals? Uh, there were three uh, big steps. The first step was uh, the adoption of the remote block driver and the Linux kernel, uh, because the used Linux kernel uh, didn't support the IMX 8X uh, platform. The second um, part was the implementation of the open AMP middleware um, onto the Cortex M4. And the last step was, of course, the benchmarking of the latency and the data throughput. Unfortunately, uh, we we don't have enough time to look into the data throughput and uh, exactly so I only represent the ben benchmarking latency later. Here you can see a quick overview of the system architecture uh, of the IMX 8X. As Troy mentioned, there are a lot of interfaces here at I2C, but for the open AMP, um, situation, I only use the marked um, components uh, in red. So I use the Core Complex 1 with the A35, the Core Complex 2 with the Cortex-M4, then the uh, memory region for shared memory, and the system control unit for remote uh, block, um, which uh, is an important um, unit which determines which uh, processor boots first. Now I want to show you the system design um, of the open amp on the IMX 8X. In, uh, in the diagram in green, you uh, can see the MP SOC, the IMX 8X. Um, in gray, you can see the APU with the Cortex A35 um, and, and white user space application. And there you can see an uh, application called Measurement. And the uh, application uh, Measurement um, is responsible for two tasks. Uh, the first task is the lifecycle uh, management, the controller, to um, start the uh, Cortex M4 with different firmwares. And the second big task uh, is the measurement controller for the latency and data throughput tests. The measurement um, communicates uh, via two interfaces with the kernel space. The first interface is, uh, is used for the uh, IPC, for the inter-processor communication, where in kernel space, the IMX RP message TTI driver provides a TTI interface where the measurement can uh, write his messages into it. And there are also some other uh, drivers for the virtual RP, RP message driver and for the IMX RP message platform driver. Um, and, on, and on the second interface, uh, which is used for the lifecycle management, where the remote proc driver provides um, SysFS interface 
um, to control the, the cortex M4. As you can see, there are two different colors, the blue and the red colors. Um, the red colors um, uh, show components which were already implemented, for example, in the kernel space, and the components which are marked in blue were implemented by myself. On the right side, you can see the, the Cortex-M4, where I implemented a Cortex-M4 application, which uh, uses the free Atos middleware, the open amp middleware, and the metal uh, middleware, which is also used by open amp. And inside the libmetal um, middleware, I uh, had to implement the IMX 8X hardware dependent porting layer where I uh, define the shared memory regions, the IPIs to create the uh, IPC between these two processors. And after the implementation on both sides, on the Linux and on the free Atos, I could create a, on the interface free uh, IP message connection. And on the low level side, on the hardware, on the interface four, uh, interprocessor inter interrupts IPIs were used to notify the other processor if a new message uh, is located into the shared memory. And therefore, messaging units were also used. And yeah. After I showed you the implementation approach, I want to go uh, further to the evaluation. Um, first, I want to talk about measurement methodology. Uh, yeah, the first question, of course, what was measured? I measured the latency time between the processors, the data throughput, and the open end processing time on the Cortex M4, and how uh, was it measured? To uh, measure the Latency, latency, latency time between the IPIs, I, uh, I used cheap IOs, which I toggled, and the toggling I measured with a logic analyzer. And to measure the latency, to, latency, latency time inside the kernel, I used the um, tracing tool F-Trace. Here you can see uh, in the figure the test system overview. Um, as you already seen in the system overview with the Linux and free Atos, here are also the, the components with the measurement on the user space, the, the, the use driver and the kernel space, and on the other side, on the Cortex M4, the M4 application. And from the components one to three, I measured the TTI device write latency, and from three, over four back to one, I, uh, I measured the TTI device read latency. And between the components three and four, so between the two processors, um, I measured the latency from the IPI from three to four uh, to the M uh, Cortex M4, and the latency back from the Cortex M4 to the RP message driver inside the Linux kernel. Yeah. Here you can uh, see uh, the, the results of uh, measurement, but some uh, important informations. My first measurements, which I uh, executed, were based on the Linux kernel without the RT patch. And of course, without a, a RT patch on the Linux, you um, get a lot of outliers, um, which are, uh, 100, 200 milliseconds. So if you need uh, read time, low, uh, low latency, you have to patch your Linux kernel. That was the first step. And then here in the frequency diagram, you can uh, see the TTI write latency. And I, for the measurement, I, I used four million measurements and I executed three measurements. And on the right side, you can see um, the results of that. For example, the arithmetic mean were around about uh, 50 microseconds, but as you can see on each uh, measurement series, there, there were a maximum outlier of around about 600 microseconds, so quite high. Here um, on this slide, you can see the uh, summary between, uh, of the latencies between the user space and the Cortex-M4. 
um, all messages which I used uh, had a message size of uh, 49,696 uh, uh, bytes. And uh, first I want to talk about latency times of the TTI device, where you can see that the outliers on the TTI write, as I mentioned in the last slide, are quite low. If you compare it with the uh, maximum latency of the TTI read latency, which is around about uh, 55 uh, milliseconds. Uh, of course, the question is which component is responsible for the high outliers. Um, the Cortex M4 can be excluded for that because there, there is there isn't a big operating system. There's just a little firmware, and um, therefore it's uh, um, th therefore I think that the Linux kernel is responsible for these big outliers and generates the, the outliers. But of course, uh, there's optimization possible inside the Linux kernel to reduce the maximum outliers. The second. Um, uh, components which I measured uh, was the IP, IPI, the inter processor interrupts latency between the Cortex M4 and the A35, uh, where you can also see that the, uh, the arithmetic mean is quite low, around about four or five microseconds in each direction, but there are still a maximum uh, outliers, around about uh, 800, uh, 600 microseconds. And my first uh, thought was that there could be a measurement error, but I uh, but I read um, I repeat the measurements uh, quite a lot, and I, I always get these high outliers. But I also think that the Cortex M4 is not responsible for the IPIs, and I think that the um, that the problem could be inside the Linux kernel. The last thing that I measured um, was the open M processing time. Here we can see that the arithmetic mean is around about uh, 200 microseconds and the maximum outlier is uh, yeah, quite high, um, uh, around about 400 microseconds. And they are, it's the yeah, same as before. It couldn't be uh, find out the, the problem for these high, these high outliers, but it could be that there, uh, there's a hardware problem on the MPSOC bus where uh, latency by the cycles which are executed occurs or a memory alignment problem uh, could uh, could it be um, yeah, um, a possible approach to reduce the outliers could be on the open end processing time to use the RP message light with a zero, zero copy mechanism or a, um, a DMA. As I mentioned, the measurement was uh, was uh, uses uh, different uh, measurement tools: the the F trace framework, the GPIO toggling mechanism, uh, and the and NFS. And there was therefore it could be that the measurement uh, methodology has a influence on the results. Therefore, I repeat the measurements with a basic setup where I just uh, measure the round trip, trip, uh, round trip time of a, a message of uh, 496 bytes from the Linux kernel to the Freatos and back to the Linux um, user space. And the result um, shows that the maximum outlier uh, went down from uh, from 55 milliseconds down to three milliseconds. So uh, the measurement um, had a big uh, influence on the outliers. Um, so it can be said that soft read time is possible when the defined and measured outliers are acceptable by the uh, project requirements. So, so, so it depends on the project, uh, but there are still optimization possible for that. Now I want to give you a short conclusion about this presentation. Uh, first, I want to talk about the IMX 8X. Um, there, I, I would say that the heterogeneous MPSOC is um, very complex and uh, I, I had a high learning curve because I, um, I learned a lot of the boot flow of several, of several different firmwares in the boot container, which was difficult to understand at the beginning. And uh, in addition, the IMX8 um, has 
different variants. You have the IMX 8M, you have the IMX 8X, and each um, variant has a different system bus and different uh, system architecture. Therefore, you need a lot of time to understand how the system works. And um, third, the IMX 8X has a dedicated system control unit for the system resource management. And in the beginning, it was also hard to understand how the system component uh, works and how this resource management uh, works. So the, the training period was very high for me. But there is a lot of extensive documentation from NXP. So you find a lot of Linux, Yocto user guides, which give you a lot of information about um, the operating system. And uh, there's also uh, a porting guidelines for the system control unit, SCFW. And there's also a lot of documentation for the secure boot um, uh, component. To conclude the OpenAMP um, part, first I want to talk about uh, um, the, the part of the porting of OpenAMP to the IMX 8X. It was um, it was manageable for the IMX 8X platform, but it depends on the on the platform which is used because it could be that the platform uh, is already supported by the OpenAMP framework, so you don't have to implement the OpenAMP OpenAMP frame framework by your uh, by yourself and the second thing is that you need a lot of interdisciplinary uh, knowledge because you must understand the boot process of the mpsoc you have to understand the linux system the linux user space the linux uh, kernel and you also have to understand the other side the low level um, component on the cortex m4 uh, cortex m4 but um, the big advantage of OpenAMP is that it uh, uses a lot of uh, standard components, for example, the virtual IO, the IP message, and the remote, remote proc uh, driver, which is already part of the Linux kernel. And the documentation of the OpenAMP um, framework is very extensive, and you can find the documentation on, on GitHub. And there's also a sync every two weeks, a uh, mailing list, an active community. So you, when if you have any questions, you can just ask them. And there, is, uh, there are also a lot of talks on YouTube about the uh, OpenAIM uh, status. So uh, now I'm in the finish. Thank you uh, for your attention, and yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so before we go to the Q&A, I uh, just want to let you know that, you know, everybody on this webinar will get a copy of the presentation and a link for uh, the uh, recorded webinar. Um, so uh, rest assured, you'll get all the information. Um, yeah, and uh, now um, let's review and see the open questions. Uh, before I'll move to David, I'll try to answer at least one of them that is more related to the SOM. And the question is that if the uh, VAR SOM MX8X has a power management IC, so yes, the VAR SOM MX8X include the PIMIC uh, for uh, power management. Okay, so the majority of the uh, SOMs uh, based on IMX8 processor includes a uh, PIMIC on them for a better uh, control on the power uh, power management of, of the SOM. Uh, so this is a question regarding uh, um, regarding the specific of the SOM and now I'll, I'll let David go through the questions and see uh, and, and share some of its uh, insight and, and answers on, on some of them. So David. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one question is, do you plan to add support for the STM32 family devices? Um, I think there is uh, already uh, implementation on the STM32. Uh, um, and you uh, maybe you can Google it and then you find uh, um, uh, STM Wikipedia, where you should find more uh, more information about that. And there's also a video on YouTube where a presentation shows you how the OpenAMP works on the STM family. 
And other question is, is it forcing to have FPGA on the SOM? Um, Tall, I think you can also answer the question. I, I, I don't think so because uh, for FPGA, you, sh you need a other uh, MPSOC. Right. Yeah, we don't we don't have songs that include FPGA, but definitely we have uh, definitely customer already integrated FPGA to different uh, peripherals. Some of the songs include uh, uh, some option to connect to FPGA, so it's not on the board, but definitely it's uh, you can able and, and connect an FPGA to to to, to the songs. Yeah. Um, is there a porting guide for porting OpenM to the various side based SOM multi core heterogeneous um, M core? Unfortunately, not there isn't a guide for that as far as I know. Another question is Is virtual IO um, driver the same as what is used by the QVM, QEMO in Linux kernel, right? Um, there's the same base virtual, virtual IO driver, but on top of the virtual IO driver, there are additional virtual, virtual IO driver for the specific platforms, as far as I know. David, I see here also maybe a good question. Uh, let me see. Uh, is the source code of your project available somewhere? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, you can find my, uh, yeah, so the, the source code is not available yet. Um, but you can find my master thesis on GitHub with more information. Maybe the master thesis can could help you. Then another question: How long did the presented uh, implementation take to achieve? Um, the, the duration of my master master thesis were six months, and I think it took around about eight weeks. But uh, I, uh, before my master thesis, I didn't uh, had a lot of knowledge about MPSOX, uh, Linux, and uh, the Cortex-M4 stuff. So the learning curve uh, was very high for me. Um, Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. A very good qu question. Is OpenM supposed to replace the legendary Open uh, Open AMP? Um, a MPI? No, I think so because the use case of the Open MPI is another use case for deploying a lot of tasks on multiple processors, and OpenM uh, has to go to provide uh, provides the lifecycle management and uh, IPC between different processors. And this is not a goal from the Open MPI. Okay, great, David. Thank you so much for answering the questions. Uh, can you go to next to the next slide? Of course. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, again, thank you everyone for uh, joining the webinar today. Uh, you can reach us to our website or to the email. Uh, you also need to our customer portal and the wiki pages and GitHub. Uh, feel free to contact us with any additional questions. Uh, again, thank you for, for the participating. David, thank you for taking us through this uh, introduction and training. And have a rest great of day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.